everyone and welcome to the Kinesis 293 lecture. Today we're going to be starting a new module. Whereas in the first module we talked about the political economy of physical culture, in this module we're going to be talking about the science of physical culture and specifically the way in which power has shaped our knowledge and understanding of bodies, physical culture, and physical activity. And I want to start by presenting this definition of kinesiology straight from the AKA website and it says that kinesiology is the academic discipline which involves the study of physical activity and its impact on health, society, and quality of life. Now the discipline of kinesiology is one of the most um, versatile disciplines that we have in the university and apart from taking into account kind of biological and um, biomechanical and, and studies like that, the hard science, physics, things like that, the hard sciences, one thing that kinesiology also takes into account is um, the social sciences and the social ways in which we understand our bodies and physical activity. So apart from the biological and the medical, a big part of kinesiology is the psychological, the social humanistic, the cultural, things as well that also play a role in how we understand ourselves. And that is ultimately what this course offers for kinesiology. Whereas the other ones give the more physical component, this is the course, along with a few others, that gives the sociocultural and historical component that also helps us understand how the discipline came to be today and how our bodies are shaped by broader social structures. And so in this module, we're going to be guided by the overall question of how do we know the body? So in module one, we kind of looked at this quote, sport like other, like music and other fine arts transcends politics. We're concerned with sports, not business or politics. This was one of the guiding quotes because we argued against it. We hopefully I proved how. Um, sports does not transcend politics, is it does not transcend business. Um, those are certainly inextricably intertwined with physical culture. And so in this module, we're going to transition to a different quote. And it's one by Richard Dawkins, in which he says, Science is the disinterested search for the objective truth about the material world. Now think about that for a second, what he's trying to say. He's essentially making the argument here that science is and always has been um, this objective search, this, this search without interest, without um, intention, and without a stake in the consequences in which people try to find the objective truth, the truth, the one truth about the material world. And that's often how we understand science. If we apply this to kinesiology, um, a similar quote would be something like, exercise science and physical education is the disinterested search for the objective truth about the limits of human performance or what makes physical activity beneficial or something like that. Whereas science is just this disinterested search. And again, in this module, we're going to argue against that. So in module two, we talked about how physical culture in the body is influenced by power and capital. So in module three, we're going to um, look at how the body is also influenced by power and sometimes capital. Specifically, we're going to look at the body as an object of scientific inquiry and educational intervention. We're going to investigate how we know and understand the body in terms of things like scientific inquiry, inquiry and intervention, um, training to full capacity and training methods, as well as um, how sport and physical education has been used to um, teach or promote certain um, social constructs, right, such as morality or to be good workers or soldiers, um, consumers, fathers, mothers, citizens, things of that sort. And hopefully in the process, we're going to try to challenge uh, these dominant assumptions regarding um, science, specifically the argument that science is devoid of 
social power. But before we do that, we need to answer kind of a more fundamental question regarding epistemology, which is essentially a word meaning the study of knowledge. And we need to ask, what is knowledge? How do we know knowledge? It has to come from somewhere, right? Where does knowledge come from? How is it spread? How is it transmitted? What constitutes truth? Now, these are some big questions that philosophers have been grappling with um, for millennium now. Um, but we're going to try to bring it down a little bit and apply it specifically to um, the science of the body. And specifically, um, how do we know knowledge about the body and physical activity and physical limits? And before we do this, we need to discuss some paradigms regarding knowledge. So I'm sure we've heard the word paradigm. Essentially, that means that um, if you're working under a paradigm, that's a set of concepts and practices um, that kind of define your approach to science, whether that's physical science or social science, um, how you identify topics, conduct research, interpret results. And it's underpinned by kind of a set of assumptions about how you view the world and the nature of truth. It essentially regards your overarching set of beliefs um, about things such as how the researcher understands reality, what is truth, what is knowledge, how do you act um, within the role of the researcher, how do you relate to participants, interpret data, disseminate knowledge, things like that. So it's a very broad sweeping term. We're going to focus on um, positive positivism and anti-positivism. Now, in the past, I've tried to kind of hammer these terms into students' heads. I'm not too worried if you understand um, kind of which term is which or if you can recite them specifically, but I, I do want you to pay attention real quick to understand the various beliefs behind it. So positivism is kind of the broad way that we understand science today. When we think of science, the scientific method that we've been trained in for years, it's a positivist scientific method. And it essentially is a paradigm that says, as Markula and, and Silk quote, through formal measurement and conceptualizing the social world as a system of variables, positivism traces facts or causes to certain phenomena, a truth that can be objectively obtained through rigorous testing of hypothesis. So this is essentially the scientific method. You put something in a lab, you remove confounding variables, you run statistical analysis, um, and the numbers don't lie, you identify the cause of something, and boom, you have your science, you have your research, and yeah. So within positivism, it has certain elements, right? A researcher can and must be objective, meaning a researcher must be free of any extraneous thoughts or biases or anything. Not only is that possible, but it's a prerequisite to doing science. It also says that universal truth exists and can be understood, basically saying that there is one truth to this universe, and through rigorous testing um, and adherence, strict adherence to the scientific method, we can understand that truth. And it says that hypotheses that we have can be um, strictly proven or disproven by the scientific method. That is, as long as we follow the scientific method, it's infallible. We'll either know a truth or know the truth that a truth is not a truth, if that makes sense, which I don't think it did. It also says that if biases are removed, a researcher can detach his or herself and see things clearly, right? That biases can be removed and that rules, processes, and truths can be explained via numbers and statistics. So now this all should seem um, pretty elementary, right? This is how we understand science, and it is. Um, and it works well. It has helped um, humanity to reach new heights and progress and modernize, um, and it, it's brought us a lot of scientific knowledge. And it applies specifically well to what we call natural sciences, such as biology and physics and chemistry, etc. However, 
and this is kind of a, a recent realization that people have had, is that people have tried to apply these same principles to the social sciences, such as sociology, history, political science, and have tried to take these principles and apply them to understanding humans and people and society and history, right? Basically arguing that in studying people, right, you can be objective, you can find a universal truth about people, you can understand it, you can have a hypothesis be proven or disproven, you can remove your biases completely and see things clearly when studying people, and that you can always explain the processes and um, the analyses of people through numbers and statistics. However, humans are a little bit more complex and unpredictable than the variables that we find in these natural sciences. And this complexity and unpredictability tends to complicate the positivist claims to truth, knowledge, and understanding. And so instead we get the advent of anti-positivist paradigms. And what these essentially do is, in a lot of ways, reject positivism when it comes to social sciences. And anti-positivist paradigms often see these knowledge claims to be subjective, that there's not this universal objective truth, but instead it's subjective and that reality is often socially constructed. It's what we make of it. So rather than seeking to try to find this truth with a capital T, interpretive paradigms try to find an understanding. They don't try to predict, just understand, because they're much more humble in, in knowing that they can't understand, and the best that they can do is get closer to the truth with a capital T. And so anti-positive paradigms basically say that no two people understand the world in the same way. It's contingent upon their experiences and education and perspectives that my truth is not your truth, and the best that I can do is understand it rather than try to predict it through numbers and stats and regression analysis and things like that. And as a researcher, I can't remove my biases when studying people in history and society. Everyone has them. I can't separate myself from the experiences and education and perspectives that I have to do objective research about things that I have a stake in. So, some anti-positivist elements counter what we see in positivism. And it often considers phenomena to be socially constructed rather than essential. Meaning that when it comes to truths about people and history and the complex human actions, society constructs those truths and basically passes them down through tradition and repetition rather than them being these essential, natural categories of humanity that would appear regardless of our actions or intentionality. It also rejects the idea that there is one universal truth and instead considers truths to be objective and contingent upon perspective and experience. And it rejects the idea that anyone can ever reach true objectivity, that anybody when studying people and society can remove themselves from it enough to understand it, quote-unquote, object objectively. And because of this, the goal of anti-positivism is not to explain things and predict things, but to merely just try to understand them, understand how the world works. And in this, qualitative validity is often prioritized over quantitative generalizability, meaning that they try to find if a truth or um, an insight is valid, is true, is authentic, rather than being generalizable to all of humanity, history, society, whatever. An essential theme of anti-positive paradigms, and one that we'll be guided by in this module, is the ways in which knowledge, how we understand ourselves, whether that's common sense knowledge, scientific knowledge, are not devoid of power. In fact, they're produced, shaped, and influenced by power, whether that be 
social, political, economic, hegemonic, whatever of the ways we talked about power in the first module. And we're going to make the argument that much of what we know when it comes to the body is not objective knowledge. In fact, things we know about the body has historically been embedded within dominant discourse and power relations. And it claims that what we know about the body historically has been politically neutral, that science is apolitical, only helps to obscure the fact that the nature of knowledge and its underlying assumptions are socially constructed by people with biases that they cannot remove from their research. And so the categories through which social science in anti-positivist research describes society are social constructions, right? Meaning that nothing when it comes to um, human creations is inevitable. It's all a product of human action and human intentionality. And therefore, if something's not working, it can be removed. We can use human agency and human intentionality to change it, to switch up these social constructions that structure our lives. And despite reality being social constructed, a lot of these truths and knowledges that we have constructed have material consequences. Just because they're socially constructed doesn't mean that they're not real. Because a lot of them influence people's lives and produce or reproduce power differentials, enable economic exploitation, and exclude people from certain spaces. Now, this isn't hard to use as an example. Just look at identity categories, such as race, sex, and sexuality, right? They all have biological bases in some way, but the understandings that we have of them are socially constructed are a product of how humans have understood them for a long time and science that has reproduced these understandings that are based on these pre-existing assumptions. Research on the body then when it comes to race and sex and sexuality should not consider these categories uncritically to be natural. Instead, throughout the history of science of the body, as we'll see in this module, much of the understandings that have been reproduced in kind of common knowledge and scientific knowledge were just post hoc justifications of racial ideologies and gendered ideologies that justified segregation within physical culture or dehumanizing or demeaning assumptions. Today we're going to focus on how that has operated through gender. Right, so as we know, um, sex is a biological categorization, right? Based on your genitalia at birth, you are either male or female. Now, of course, there's a small but significant portion of the population that is intersex and would not um, be categorized as male or female. But broadly, your sex is your biological categorization. Now, a lot of people conflate sex and gender. But gender, on the other hand, is a social construction. All gender is, is basically masculinity or femininity. Or what it means to be male versus what it means to be female. So, well, being male is natural. What it means to be male is certainly socially constructed. is a product of cultural and social expectations that we've conflated to be associated with the natural state of being a male or a female, but does not essentially have to be. And we know that because across time, across culture, across regions, whatever, the biological categorization of male and female has not changed. It has been the same throughout history, throughout place, throughout time, whatever. However, gender is very much different and very much contingent on social and cultural context, not only based on time, but even today in, in um, today's society, 
if you go in different places around the world, you'll see that masculinity and femininity have very different definitions than they do in another place of the world. So that tells us that sex is biological, but what it means to be male or female is very much contingent on cultural expectations. And so although these are kind of arbitrary, right, just kind of made up by humans one day and then they stuck, they still have real social consequences. And those consequences we talked about in the first module. And I want to bring back these three eyes by McDonough and Papineau. Inferiority, injury, and immorality. Hopefully we remember these. And so immorality, right, this it was the idea that women competing against men was antithetical to traditional gender roles. That if women played sports, they would be they would have masculine traits, um, or be a homosexual, or whatever, right? Because that's an important point to make when I said that um, gender is a social construction, right? It's not just uh, well, masculinity and femininity are different. They're just two sides of the coin. That probably could be true, right? And that would be fine if it was true, I think, maybe. I haven't critically thought about it. But regardless, that's just a hypothetical because we know it's not true. We know that it's always a hierarchization, meaning that in most cultures, masculinity has always been in some way privileged over femininity. And that's something that we intuitively understand, right? And it's the same way in sports. And so we see this in the case study of sex testing. And sex testing makes for um, an interesting vehicle for understanding how these gendered expectations um, not only affect people's lives, but reproduce themselves through knowledge of the body. And in 1999, um, we get French tennis player Amélie Marismo uh, was criticized by her competitors, basically said that, well, she's a man. They described her as half a man and that playing against her was like playing a guy. And in this, they're essentially saying that, one, she's too good at tennis and to be good at something sports related is masculine. Therefore, she's masculine, but also by her appearance, she doesn't um, fit this arbitrarily constructed box of femininity that our culture understands. And this has a long history, the allegation of, play, of, of calling women men or masculine or secretly a man, has a long history in sport. In the 1960s Olympics, we see the sex of um, these Ukrainian sisters, Tamara and Arena Press, questioned after they won five medals, because as, as we've established, success in sport is often conflated with masculinity. And so they question their femininity, right? However, they're from Ukraine. And as we talked about, gender is a social construction. Therefore, what it meant to be female in Ukraine was very different than what it meant to be female in America or Europe, which essentially is the um, kind of has a cultural hegemony over the Olympics. And so, post-World War II, um, a lot of white female athletes didn't want to violate these strict gender laws. As we talked about, that was the re-feminization of America, where women went back to being housewives and fulfilling these um, traditional gendered expectations in the private sphere. However, a lot of African American women were blocked from this. Um, but they did find Olympic success. However, that success that they found often reinforced these stereotypes of black women as being less feminine than white women, being more brutish. Um, and instead of just congratulating black women for being good at sports, they, they use it as evidence that black women are inherently more masculine than the white woman, who is kind of the American Euro European white woman, who was often seen as kind of this gold standard of traditional femininity, quote-unquote. And in this, we see the intersection of race and gender. 
And this historically strict separation of gender roles that we've seen throughout American history, especially uh, this idea that masculinity and femininity are polar opposites that need to be separated and, and strictly policed instead of a spectrum in which all people have some of each, this social anxiety over women masquerading as men or men masquerading as women, especially in the context of sport, manifested in this ugly practice of sex verification. And starting in 1946, the IAF basically introduced this rule in which female competitors needed to prove their edibility in women's sport, essentially meaning that they needed to prove that they were women because to be men um, would be an unfair advantage, right? As if sport itself is a fair playing field. And by the 1960s, so b before the 1960s, they needed to bring in a doctor's note basically saying that, yes, this person is female. Um, but by the 1960s, a lot of athletic organizations um, brought in their own doctors because they didn't, they didn't trust um, the honor code. They thought that um, a lot of women were cheating the system and, and paying off doctors or something like that. And so we get sex testing. And initially, um, it was just visual, right? And I say just, um, that's kind of a bad word because visually it was very demeaning and suggestive and dehumanizing, um, humiliating. Essentially, they would have these um, Olympic doctors, all kind of these old white guys sitting in a chair and women one by one would strip down naked show them their woman parts, and then the doctors would unilaterally decide, yes, you are female enough, or no, you are not female enough, which is kind of terrible, right? Later, um, they decided they need to feel if women were women enough um, or not, and that was basically part of the equation. So kind of basically straight up sexual assault um, just to compete in an Olympic event, right? Something that, of course, men didn't have to go through. Um, and this went on for eight years until they decided that even that wasn't enough. Maybe some men may still be getting away with competing in women's sports. And so they started to use chromosomal tests to verify sex. They would swab the cheek of women and then examine the cells to see if you were in fact had XX chromosomes or XY chromosomes um, to prove, quote unquote, that you were a woman. And if you passed your test, you could get your fem card that basically says, yes, I am a woman. Now, as we know, not only was this gross and dehumanizing and straight up stupid, but it was also bad science, right? Because no matter what they did, um, they couldn't identify even biological sex. Um, what this did was marginalize intersex people, right? Who was 1.7% of births and had gen genital ambiguity and other medical conditions, right? So even if we take what they did in good faith, it's still bad science. And in 2011, yes, that recently, the IAFF decided that um, the sex testing that they were doing, um, well, there was backlash and it went away for a while. They decided that um, they needed to institute testosterone tests to make sure that female athletes were, in fact, um, female enough, or I should say not too male right? But as we know, even this was flawed um, in that there's no definitive connection between hyperandrogenism and athletic ability, meaning that um, women who naturally have more testosterone um, than quote-unquote normal women, there's no proof, there's no scientific evidence that that leads to greater athletic ability. So this obsessive sex testing was what women had to go through just to compete in sports. 
And a lot of women decided to just sit out that they weren't going to subject themselves to this. And, and I can't blame them. Um, but this is a real life example of how these strictly policed and bordered social constructions have these sometimes gross um, material consequences in people's lives. And these constructions are just arbitrary. And as Schultz talks about with this sex testing, the logic that undergirds the history of sex testing is that gendered expectations become sexed imperatives, basically meaning that um, the expectations we had of gender, the social construction of masculinity and femininity through this testing was thought to predetermine what woman, women should be. And therefore, anyone who didn't fall into that category was not woman enough and therefore had an unfair advantage. As a result, social concerns are exercised on the material body of the female athlete. And this is a clear example right here in that although it was supposedly based in objective science, it's clear that sex testing was based in social anxieties and exacerbated by social anxieties over the separation of genders. And therefore, you know, this was done by people who, at the end of the day, were still arguing that women shouldn't play sports, that the outcome of women's sports doesn't matter. So it would be naive of us to think that they were actually worried about equal competition or the sanctity of women's sports. No, I think that they were more... Um, worried about enforcing this Amero-Eurocentric social construction of femininity and therefore punishing those who did not fall within this very narrow window. And as Schultz talks about, the various iterations of sex testing are designed to disadvantage women who, for one reason or another, do not align with the established social, biological, or genetic parameters of femaleness. So Schultz here agrees. The power of patriarchy, in this case, shaped the physical cultural experiences of women. And another eye injury is also based on pseudoscience and the influence of power. And so, as we talked about, um, based upon this need to protect women from injuries, men often structured women's physical cultural experiences. Um, to be moderated, to be made sure that they exerted themselves less and were less aggressive and had less physical context, contact um, with the pretext that they were protecting women from injuring themselves or from danger or overexertion or whatever under the assumption that women are weaker, more prone to injury, have less endurance, all of which we know are not true. And as the Vertinsky article talks about in depth, um, a lot of pseudo pseudoscientists pointed to menstruation as kind of the mechanism through which um, this idea of injury and inferiority was based upon. And so they utilize these scientific, pseudoscientific theories about the effects of the reproductive life cycle um, to control women um, and set limits upon their activity. And this, of course, was not deduced from scientific inquiry as much as it was just a product of dominant power relations. Um, basically, men taking it upon themselves to control and structure the lives of women, reinforce social barriers, preserve sport as a male domain, things of that sort. And so let's look at um, a little bit deeper into the science of the physical capacity of women. And so Beamish and Ritchie talk about how historically there's been beliefs of physical capacity based on the first law of thermodynamics, which states that total energy within a closed system is constant and that it cannot be created or destroyed. Meaning that people believed for a long time that energy was finite, that you have a certain amount of it, and once it's gone, it's gone, 
Therefore, you need to ration it out appropriately. And bodies specifically were seen as these closed systems um, where people had a finite amount of energy over their lifetime. And basically any diminishment of, of the body's vital fluids or vital energies, as they were called, um, would weaken the person and leave them vulnerable to injury, disease, or domination. There is this idea that the more energy that you have, the stronger that you are, um, the less prone you are to, to getting sick, whatever. And we can see this ideology being espoused through um, Herbert Spencer, who was a quote-unquote scientist of um, menstruation, where he says, Nature is a strict accountant. And if you demand of her in one direction more than she's prepared to lay out, she balances the account by making a deduction elsewhere. And so this kind of seems like um, a silly understanding of energy. Um, however, it's, it's one that still is um, present. And we see it espoused by the most powerful man in the world. But this belief that energy was finite and that you needed to protect it to be your best self and live your best life um, was something that affected men as well. And under this thinking about energy, um, it was understood that if men preserved their vital fluid, which in this case um, was semen, that they would perform better within sport or, or any other physically active um, exercise. And so we get this pseudoscientific understanding of male abstinence. As um, the physician Eratius um, said in the first century, if any man is in possession of semen, he's fierce, courageous, and physically mighty like beasts. Evidence for this is to be found in athletes who practice abstinence. So there's this idea that um, if men lose their semen, that they'll no longer be manly, be these beasts that fight. We see kind of the same ideology in Rocky, where um, he basically denies women before um, the big fights, right? The idea that women weaken legs, as Rocky liked to say. And so the fact that men could consciously control their vital fluids um, gave credence to the idea that they're more capable for physical culture. Whereas on the flip side, because women could not control their vital fluids, which was the blood from menstruation, physical culture was to be avoided. Um, science, medical science, quote unquote, all the way um, into the 1900s treated menstruation as an aberration, as this dangerous and disabling tradition, or or I'm sorry, condition, um, as the Vertinsky article talks about. They thought that um, it was caused by a vulnerability, right? And it was cited as evidence of the poor health of a woman, fatigue, pain, mood swings, um, irregularities, whatever. Despite the fact that every, every woman menstruated, right? It was still seen as something that was bad. That if you menstruated, um, you were doing something wrong with your life. It was clean. It was unhealthy. It was to be not talked about. And most importantly, um, it was evidence that women are losing their vital fluids without control. And therefore, since they're already losing it, they can't participate in physical activity and lose it even more. Since this energy, as people thought, was finite. Therefore, when women menstruated... They lost their energy every month in the process. And in addition, the fact that women did this regularly every month was kind of seen um, as evidence that evolution um, created them to be inferior. And so because of this, like I said, menstruation was seen as this eternal wound, um, and it was used to... Um, prevent women from engaging in exercise, athletic competition, um, as a way to protect their reproductive capacity. It was seen that 
Um, women need to save their energy. They're already limited and depleting energy for quote unquote women things, which at that time was tending to the private sphere and reproducing. Therefore, not only was physical physical activity um, a waste of time and immoral, but it was actively dangerous as the more a woman was physically active, um, the less capable she would be of reproducing, which was seen as the cultural expectation of women at that time. As Spencer talks about, um, since women are smaller and weaker than men, it was already seen that they possess less amounts of energy and that the energy that they do have that's quickly going away through menstruation should be preserved for the demands of reproduction and the good of the species, right? Very sexist pseudoscience. And so because of this, in this context, it makes sense why women's sports, when they were allowed to play sports, was moderated. Um, to kind of counter the claims that they were being sexist and exclusive by not letting women play sports, but also to make sure that they weren't expending more energy than was necessary, right? That there was a right way for women to play sports, and it was within the box of the social construction of femininity, and there was no need for um, kind of this intense competition, aggression, exertion, or contact. Because of this, there were these um, physical activities that were seen as proper for women. And it was kind of calisthenics, gymnastics, domestic exercises such as sweeping, walking, riding, things that... Um, would still allow women to be in shape, but wouldn't deplete this vital energy as it was seen. Because in the early um, 20th century, by the mid-1900s, um, people kind of, there was more research done into menstruation, and people realized that um, a lot of the ideas they had of it were flawed, um, but still, the residues remained of this theory, and it very much shaped what physical activities women could do. And so we see these um, male-developed theories of women's physical capacities um, not only shaping what they could be included in, but when they are included, shaping the very structure of the games that they could be included in. We see a lot of games such as basketball having their rules adapted to make it more appropriate for female participation. And this video has kind of a case study of women's basketball. At the dawn of the 20th century, America was in the midst of an industrial and social revolution. Increasing numbers of women were entering the industrial labor force as well as professions, including business, law, and medicine. Women's colleges, known for their rigorous academic requirements, began implementing physical education programs into their curricula, with expectations far exceeding good health habits. In 1890, Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, built one of the largest, most well-equipped gymnasiums in the country, and in 1892, appointed 23-year-old Senda Berenson as physical educator. Berenson's task was to implement a daily fitness regimen for Smith students to improve their physical strength and to prepare them for the rigors of employment in the workforce. Initially, Berenson's greatest challenge was keeping her students engaged. In 1892, physical education activities consisted of marching in time and performing Swedish gymnastics, a synchronized form of stretching and strength exercises. Students quickly became bored and would find any kind of excuse to get out of class. While searching for an activity that would motivate her students, Berenson unknowingly transformed the world of women's sports. James Naismith, a young instructor at the YMCA Training School in Springfield, Massachusetts, had recently developed a new indoor sport for men called basketball. Berenson read a magazine article in which Naismith described the game, and she was immediately intrigued with the idea of implementing the sport into her own curriculum. 
With one football and two waste paper baskets suspended from the gymnasium ceiling, Berenson introduced 400 Smith students to the game of basketball, eliciting great enthusiasm from the participants. Friday afternoon at the gym, we played a game. Instead of going through the ordinary performances, two waste paper baskets were hung, one on either side of the gym, about three feet above our heads. We had a football which was to be touched only with the hands, and the object was to get it into your opponent's basket and keep it out of your own. It was great fun and very exciting, especially when we got knocked down, as frequently happened. On March 22, 1893, the first Smith College Basketball Championship was held between the sophomores, the class of 1895, and the freshmen, the class of 1896. Over 800 students attended the event, which consisted of two 15-minute halves and one 10-minute intermission. A single point was awarded for each basket scored. The entire college turned out with class colors and banners waving. They filled the broad balcony, the early ones sitting on the edge dangling their legs, the others standing along the walls. As I threw the ball for the beginning of the game, the cheering and screaming of the spectators was a high-pitched sound I do believe no one had ever heard before and was deafening. In 1893, women competing in a team sport was a radical concept. The medical profession was adamantly opposed to women's athletics and had issued several warnings about the negative effects of physical activity for women. By including basketball in her program, Berenson faced criticism from the public and concern from parents. Dearest Mama, don't believe the newspaper article. I have seen others similar to it, and they are all wrong. Helen Abbott did break her collarbone by running against the president's platform, but that's about all the paper got straight. Her collarbone is not badly splintered either, for it is a small, clean break. And moreover, the faculty haven't taken up the movement to abolish basketball, as the paper says. Neither have her parents made any demand to stop the game. Berenson remained undaunted by the opposition she faced in introducing basketball for women. With three simple rule changes, she designed women's basketball to avoid the physical roughness often associated with the men's game. First, she divided the court into three equal sections and required players to stay in their assigned section. Second, she prohibited players from snatching or batting the ball from the hands of another player. And third, to increase the pace of the game, players were not permitted to hold the ball for longer than three seconds. The popularity of basketball soared on campus. Students played the game in physical education classes in the fall and winter and eagerly anticipated the announcement of class teams for the spring championship. So as we can see from that video, Berenson developed um, a set of rules of basketball that would be quote unquote appropriate for women, including nine players per team, divided into three areas where players had to stay in their one area, could only dribble the ball three times and hold it for three seconds, and you couldn't snatch the ball away from another woman, couldn't have physical contact or do anything to hinder the shooter. Basically basketball, but completely watered down. And despite these adaptations, a lot of people, um, specifically men, still tried to limit opportunities for females um, to play competitive basketball in high school and college, um, denying them resources all the way until Title IX. Um, additionally, there was this common practice called play days that lasted in the uh, mid-1900s, in which basically universities would have play days in which women would convene um, and play these kind of games and competitions that were not serious, um, was kind of implemented for their jolly sociability, um, but was kind of the extent to which women's physical culture activities um, were tolerated. Again, the fact that um, women needed to be sociable when playing sports um, reaffirmed these expectations of femini femininity that we have. So in conclusion, Although female inf inferiority was explained as natural by science, right, we can see that these scientific explanations were false and that they were more constructed through power relations, specifically these contextual societal expectations of masculinity and femininity that were completely arbitrary yet still had material consequences, right? And the fact that science, the science that... Um, espoused to these myths was seen as neutral and objective only obscured the fact that they were so hindered by power relations and they reproduced these expectations in the process 
And as we'll discuss in this module, um, this is the case for a lot of scientific discourses, specifically surrounding genetics, health, fitness, human performance. Um, they're often used to justify um, and obscure the operations of power. And despite its claims of objectivity, when it comes to social science, um, science has done a lot of good things and has helped us progress in many ways. However, we can't ignore the fact that science has um, historically been embedded within power relations and has been used to reinforce and justify inequitable and exploitative social relations, more of which we'll talk about um, and complicate throughout this module. Thank you.